Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome uh, to how to get into the games industry with Donald Harris um, of Farbridge Games. He is the executive producer uh, at Farbridge, and he also started uh, ATX Game Makers, which is a nonprofit. So uh, his career has taken him from Titanfall uh, to Goldman Sachs and everywhere in between. He enjoys growing and leading business development, project management, and product development teams. Uh, getting to combine amazing people with great technology is what gets him out of bed in the morning. And he's always on the hustle to make experiences that inspire, entertain, and take away from your everyday life. So without further ado, welcome Donald Harris. Thank you, Maya. That was a, uh, that was a pretty good introduction. I'm gonna have to like record that and like use that from, from now on. So yeah, um, again, my name is Donald Harris. Um, I gave a, a little bit of a background uh, on me here and I'll cover a little bit more uh, within once we get into the talk. But without further ado, what we'll do is we'll go over the talk. I have some slides to show everyone and some key talking points. And then we can have uh, some time left over for a Q&A afterwards. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. And so just to make sure that everyone can see uh, see the screen, is everyone able to see the screen? Good, 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 good. So as you know, the talk is called Getting a Job in the Games Industry. Um, <clears throat> this presentation will cover four key points. It'll give you a little bit of my background. It'll talk about building a network. And then finally, the key piece that what we're all here about is getting a job and then some key takeaways that I think it's very important for folks to, uh, to have coming out of this. So a brief history of a tall gamer. So for those of you who don't know, I go by the online moniker, tall gamer. Uh, that's because I am very, very creative. I am 6'8", and I like to play video games. So uh, I came up with that, that username, and it's stuck around ever since. Um, I, some of the games I've worked on is Titanfall, Ruby Grim Eclipse, which is probably the one of more the recent games. Um, and actually, I need to update this. So uh, my studio just got involved with Battlefield Mobile. Um, and that's something that we announced uh, two months ago. And so Transport Tycoon, Monopoly, Bingo, Terra Pets, like I've been all over the board. So from consoles to mobile handheld games, had a lot of fun in all of those different projects. Uh, some of the companies that I've worked for in the past, again, that, that first one there is ATX Game Makers. So that is my own nonprofit uh, agency where I try and help increase the diversity within the games industry. I am currently employed as an executive producer at Farbridge, spent a lot of time at EA on different games there. And I even did some time at Gold, Goldman Sachs um, as a vice president there, in which, you know, that's a, it's a big bank out of New York and just a lot of fun, learned a lot. I'm not into finance. Uh, that's one of the big things that I've learned. And then of course I, I spent a lot of time working at Dell. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where I've come from and we'll get right into it. So with the goal of the talk on how to get a job, with the goal of the talk, being how to get a job within the games industry. I think one of the key pieces for everyone here is to know yourself, right? So um, to know thyself is the beginning of wisdom. Know what you wanna do within the games industry. Like when people look at the games industry, they think either A, it's just like, oh, it's programming and art, uh, or, and, and you know, that's it, right? They, they break it down into those two basic functions of, of are two basic disciplines within the industry. But as you see here, I have a large amount of disciplines and that doesn't even cover the, the full gamut of uh, uh, different things that you can do within the industry, right? We got art, design, narrative design, production, which is where I focused my efforts into, uh, programming, sound design, UI, UX, so forth and so on. Um, one of the things is like, if you, if you, you guys are in school now, and um, and let's say, for instance, you're taking up programming and you know you want to be in the games industry, but you're having a hard time in programming. If it's not your bag, get into project management, right? And so project management is production. That's what my bag is. 
that is, you know, in the games industry, we call it production, but it's really just project management, planning, organizing, and helping your team succeed. That's what I love, love doing at the, at the end of the day. That's, so for me, that was my way into the industry. So do some additional research before you spend a lot of time and, and definitely do more research before you give up that dream of getting into the, uh, into the industry. Look at all the different positions and speak to, to many different people who have those positions so you get to learn more. Um, once you figure out what it is that you love and what it is that you like to do and what it is that you think you can do for eight hours a day and not claw your eyes out and still enjoy your life, start building a portfolio, right? Again, portfolios aren't just for artists and programmers and sound designers. Pro portfolios can be for narrative. It, portfolios can be for everyone, right? Um, before I went down the path of uh, getting into speaking about games and speaking about the industry, my personal website was my portfolio. And it talked about all the different games that I've worked on and then the different positions that I had within those studios. Uh, as a producer or as a QA engineer or as a QA manager, um, I had those things listed out. So that was my own personal portfolio. And even before I got into the industry, I started listing games and listing little indie projects that I was a part of. Or, you know, um, I even used examples from Dell to make my way into the games industry. You know, again, speaking to those folks who aren't in the industry, you have to use what you already have, right? If you have school projects that you're working on, list them out, right? L link them out. I spoke with a, a young man, um, I won't say what school he's from because he wasn't necessarily, you know, I don't want to start in fights, uh, but he was from a different college and his online portfolio didn't have links to where I, a potential employer, could go download those games or download those um, interactive scenes to, to give a review and to get an understanding more of his work. So make sure when you build out this portfolio, do it in such a way that um, it displays your work as, as much as possible, right? And get other people to critique your, your, your portfolio if you can, like teachers within, within your school or uh, mentors, which I'll, I'll get into here in just a second. And next up, while you're building your portfolio, while you're going through school, you got to be very, very aware of, uh, oh, I guess uh, Alexa is going to help me out on this talk here. Sorry about that. Uh, so you have to be very aware of what is called the skill gap, right? So when you're looking at your personal portfolio and your personal work, your skill level is going to be at one level. But what you appreciate and what you like is probably going to be at a much higher level. <clears throat> and when you start to compare yourself to what you like versus what you're able to produce, you might get disheartened. And what I had to say to that is you got to keep pushing. You have to keep pushing through that to where your skills start to meet up with your taste. And that's, what's, that's what that gap is is where there's that delta, right? And so don't get discouraged, keep pushing through it and understanding that you have to grow. You're, you know, I'm making an assumption here about the audience, but all of you are probably pretty young um, and you only had a couple of years experience and you're looking at folks who've been in this industry for 10, 15, 20 years and comparing yourself to that. Don't compare yourself as a target so that's where you want to be, but don't let that get you down. Keep pushing. Um, and then one of the next important things uh, that I feel that, that's very much needed when you are preparing to get yourself into the industry is building out a network. Um, I spoke a little bit uh, pre-game show with, with um, the folks in here but before everybody joined in and, and the importance of a network, it's huge, right? So again, you're in school, you might be coming into the to the to the workplace or to the to the market, um, as it were, and you don't know anyone, right? That can be that can be scary. Getting to know folks in the industry is not as difficult as you think. Um, you know, there's many different places and, and conferences, and now that conferences are online, they might even be more accessible to you. 
right? So start getting into the different networks. Use the networks that you're already using. If you're already on Twitter or Instagram and things like that, jump on that network, start connecting with other game developers. There's plenty of people who, again, like if we start from the top, right? We say, okay, I know that I want to be a producer. So let me go look for producers on these particular networks, right? And so here are some examples. I, I just mentioned Twitter and Instagram. Um, we have LinkedIn, which is a huge one for me. ArtStation, obviously that's that's a lot uh, focused on artists and GitHub is focused on mostly scripting and programming. Uh, and then local uh, communities such as mine, which is ATX Game Makers, um, look for those types of communities to join and getting to know people who are already in the industry. And that's just gonna help you define yourself. It's gonna help you when it comes time to reviewing your portfolio. And it's gonna help you probably make decisions on whether or not you want those jobs that you that you might've started out with, right? So it all flows into, into one cohesive movement. Well, and then, this is a big one for me. Uh, networking is a two-way street, right? So when you do get into these networking events and, and, and you're building out your network and you're, you're connecting with people, don't just say, gimme, 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 gimme. That's, that's, a, that's a bad way to, to form a relationship, right? Just relationship one-on-one. Um, you wanna be able to give back. And that can look like many different things depending on which networks you're in, which people you're trying to connect with. If you are trying to connect with someone, let's just say, I'm gonna use myself as an example. If you're trying to connect with me on ATX Game Makers, hey, that's great. I love working with you. I love helping you out. If you turn around and say, hey, Donald, what can I do for you to help you out with the community here at ATX Game Makers? I say, oh man, you know what? I could use some art uh, helping me develop some slides so that I can go make a presentation about ATX Game Makers or I could use a blog post, you know, can you tell me about your experiences? When you start doing that, there's a couple of different things that happen. You make my life easier and then I can therefore spend more time helping you do the things that you need to do in order to get you in the industry. And then also you're helping lift up that community as a whole as well. So there's a lot of big benefits in, in uh, in, in giving back to the communities that you're in. And then you're gonna learn more. Next up, don't go alone, right? If you can, secure yourself a mentor. Um, in my personal experience, I, you know, I, like I said, I'm about 15 years into the industry and I still have mentors. There are still folks that have been in this thing longer than I have. They're older than me. They bump their head many, many more times than me and I still lean on them for guidance. Um, as well as when I was trying to get into the industry, uh, there was a, a, a mentor, my very first mentor, his name was Jay Moore. And literally this guy, and I mean this literally, he drug me into uh, secret meetings, or not secret meetings, but like events that I, were, I, that I wasn't invited to with Sony and Nintendo and Konami and so here I am, I'm finding myself in these places where normally I wouldn't be able to go because I had a mentor helping me get there, right? That's the physical way is one way, but also like, you know, training you and bringing you up and helping you guide you along the way is another one. But um, mentors are extremely, extremely valuable. Uh, they can help point you to jobs that are coming up. They can help point you to studios that they feel that you can grow and flourish in because they know all of the folks there. So um, I, I can't, I really can't overstate how important a mentor is. Um, and again, you can find those mentors in those previous communities that we just talked about, right? So again, it's all one common thought here. And then once you have all of that stuff lined up, right? You, you have, uh, you know, an idea of what you want to do with your life. You have a portfolio that, that you're maintaining and building. You have a network now that you can tap into and say, oh, Donald's hiring at Farbridge. You know, I, I, I talk to Donald all the time, like talk to him about production. Maybe I can be a junior producer there, right? Boom, you got your resume created. You can run this resume by people in your community 
or even have your mentor check out your resume. So now it's all prim and proper and perfect. And then start applying and start applying often. Uh, yes, you know, the games industry is definitely in a boom state right now. We're doing a lot of hiring. Um, over the pandemic, my studio in particular, we hired uh, seven people. And, you know, that's a lot for, for a studio that was under 20 people at the start of the pandemic. And so we're still hiring today. Um, and so every studio is hiring, uh, but everyone is also applying. So even though you may not get in the first time, keep applying, keep looking out there, keep your head up and keep trying and trying again. It's, it's you know, it can be like telling your mom that you want to grow up to be a rock star, right? Because everybody wants to be in the games and, and it can be a flashy industry. So there's a lot of attract or a lot of attention to it, but keep applying, keep, keep, keep trying. And so this brings us to the end of the talk here. So some of the key takeaways, again, create, a, a, create that portfolio, no matter what your discipline that you choose, build a network and get a mentor, get a mentor, get a mentor. I probably should just like take away all of these takeaways and just put, get a mentor. Um, and then be patient and work through uh, rejections. It's gonna happen. You're gonna be rejected. Um, it, it, it just, it's the nature of the beast. Don't get discouraged. You gotta keep trying. So those are the things uh, that, that have helped me out. Those are the things that I use to help folks on, in my community get jobs. Um, it's, it's a proven method. So I like to tell people that this is, this is a surefire way to help you get into the industry. And so I definitely want to open up the floor to any questions. I actually have uh, uh, anecdotes. I would love to hear a story. So uh, could you talk a little bit more um, about networking? And by the way, the reason I know Donald to say this is because of networking. <laughs> but um, could you talk, give maybe some examples of, of networking for the students and how that's helped you out? Yeah. So um... There is so in high school, I was voted most likely to make themselves known everywhere, i.e., I talk a lot. Uh, so when when it came time to uh, go to my first gaming conferences and things like that, I had zero skills. I was actually in a completely different industry. I was in hardware sales uh, for computers. And I I just made it a point to find someone who looked important and strike up a conversation with them, right? Uh, you know, there, there are social events at all of these different conferences, even the ones that are online now. Um, they will usually have a Discord component to where like, hey, go hang out in our Discord in between the different presentations. That is your time to start building up a network. And those are the times where I utilize those times to start uh, asking questions, getting to know folks, and then reaching out with them and connecting on LinkedIn. One of my, um, I, think, I think everyone watching should have a LinkedIn profile. Everyone watching should have a LinkedIn profile, no matter what. Um, even if you don't have a professional job just yet, list your school. That is the start of your profile that shows me that, hey, this person is at Texas A&M, they're doing visual studies, they are studying this, that, and the other. That helps me get a baseline understanding of you. Um, and then from there, strike up conversations. Like uh, the, the, the person that I, I spoke about earlier, all they did was they just asked me, hey, can I talk to you about your journey into games? That led into an hour long conversation where I rewrote his resume and I gave him uh, um, a whole bunch of tips on rewriting his website to make it more appropriate and to make it easier for potential people to hire. Him. So um, you just gotta you just gotta step out of your comfort zone and and get to know people, which can be it can be tough, right? So maybe uh, if if you're a more shy person, definitely use the digital tools such as email and Discord and Twitter and 
those things and, and just go from there. You don't have to do a Zoom chat with people. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a big benefit and it's still benefiting me today, right? So um, when I do attend different conferences or I speak at different events, um, I will still reach out to the crowd and try to get to know people. And that's how I strike up deals and find people who work at um, uh, Wizards of the Coast. So uh, Mayad, I think, weren't we on with uh, Carmen Ascanis? Yes, that was um, uh, being black in game development. And I was, you, you were on the panel with Carmen and I was uh, the moderator. Yeah, and so that right there, I, I had never, I, I kind of knew of Carmen, didn't really know, like, know him well, but yeah, we definitely struck up a conversation after that talk. And now I can say I have a friend who works at Wizards of the Coast. So, you know, I can get me some trading cards here in just a bit. But uh, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, uh, it's always beneficial. It's always something that you should do even after you get a job in the industry. You want to continue to build that network. Can I just talk about how small the industry is really quick? So another person on that panel was Evan. And then a couple weeks later, Powerhouse Animation, where my husband works, they had a get together at Brad's house. Brad is one of the owners of, of Powerhouse. And they were inviting partners as well as their executive, you know, their upper level team. So my husband went to that and who should be there but Evan, and so he went up to Evan, he was like, oh, I, you know my wife, and he was like, what? He was like, Mayette, and he was like, what? <laughs> so, I mean, that's how small the world is. <laughs> yeah, I, so it's funny, I, ha I have a, a similar story. Um, I was at one event, and there were these two CEOs, I was friends, friends with one of them, and the conversation, I'm paraphrasing the conversation, but CEO A was like, hey, we're wrapping up this project. I have this amazing artist um, and I hate to see them go, but I don't have any more work for them. CEO B was like, go on, because I need an amazing artist, blah, blah, blah. And he says, hey, here's his name. Um, he'll be, like, his work will be done in two months. Um, I would love to introduce you to him. And the guy was like, looking at his work, he's like, oh, he will fit perfectly. This person lost their job and gained a job without even knowing it. And so um, when we talk about, when we talk about how small the industry is, you know, common sense, keeping your nose clean uh, when you are on Twitter and you are on LinkedIn and, and, and Facebook and all of these things, keep in mind, everything you do, everybody sees. Uh, so it, it's, stuff gets around, uh, you can, I'm sure you guys can all read about the nasty things that go on in this industry. Um, and so don't be a part of that. Be a good human and, and, uh, yeah, that, that stuff spreads. Are there any questions? And people can put their questions in the chat too, if they don't want to, uh, vocalize them. Uh, we'll be happy for that. But uh, while we're waiting for more questions, what are some do's and don'ts in resumes that you see? Um, one of the one of the funny things on the don'ts that have come up recently is don't put like 300 million examples of your work, right? And, and the reason why I say that is because Yes, I said, hey, you know, build your portfolio. Uh, and of course, on your resume, you want to either link to your portfolio or have some examples on your resume. What's going to happen is when you try to pick your favorite and you're picking all of everything you've ever created, you're going to pull something back, you know, from two, three years ago when your skills might have improved. So try to pick your top five, your top three. Um, Keep the keep the resume thinner, uh, especially now since since so many folks are, are applying. Right? Do I feel like reading a three page resume? No, no, I don't. Uh, especially when I have like fifty more to go through. Um, and I'm just being honest. Like I'm, you know, uh, keeping the resume down to like one page 
Um, I have gone the route of having my my cover letter. I don't have a cover letter anymore. I just have like a paragraph summary of you know explaining kind of like at a, at a high level who I am, what my goals and aspirations are. Uh, like three, four sentences max. And so, yeah. We have a question from the audience. Um, Grace asks, can you speak on your personal experience as a mentor? Yeah, so um, I, I've mentored quite a few people and it's, it's, it's been rewarding. Overall, it's, it's rewarding. Um, it, is, it is definitely work and it's work for both, both parties, right? So it's work for the mentor to come up with tasks for you to do in, in order for you to learn and they're taking time out of their day to do that. One of the things that I will say um, is not only do you need to find a good mentor who's going to put time into you, you need to put time into him or them, right? So what I mean by that is you need to be a good mentee. I have had mentees that didn't do work and they expected results. And so it just became one of those things where I'm just like, hey, I'd love to help you. But if you're if, if you're not getting back to me with work being done, or like if I say, hey, here are the points that I think you need to update or change in your resume. Here are the points that I, need, I think you need to update or, or, or revisit on, on your portfolio. And you aren't doing those things that I can't give you back the guidance that you need to move forward. So um, whereas, you know, I can put a lot of work into people, but unless they want to do the work themselves, it won't, it won't go very, very far. But it is fun and rewarding. Like I've, I've had a, um, some unexpected stories. One of the, the favorite stories that I like to tell is um, I was helping this young woman uh, get into, um, oh, what's it, Robert Space Industries. They do, they work on uh, Star Citizen. And she and I were like, we were going through it, man. Like going through her portfolio, her resume. And um, I said, hey, meet me at Starbucks. You know, bring, bring the new resume, meet me at Starbucks. And what I did was I, I, I planned a surprise interview for her. So as soon as she sat down at the table, I went in and just started interviewing her. Like I was like, so that I could get her mind fresh. And, and so we kept practicing, interviewing, interviewing. And then she finally got the job and she told me that, uh, with, you know, what she didn't reveal until after she told me everything, she's like, hey, I just want to thank you because like, not only did you help me get a job with my dreams, but you helped me stay in Austin, right? So like you've changed my life in the sense that you got a, a job, you helped me get a job that I've always wanted and I don't have to move back in with my parents. And so for me, that was like super, super heartwarming. Like I was, I'm just trying to help people get into something that they want to do and be happy. Okay, we've got a couple more. Let's, oh, Grace says, thank you. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> test, test. Yep, I can hear you. Okay, good, good. All right, Grace says, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, one of her hesitations has been um, in finding a mentor is that they, she doesn't want to waste their time. Um, but like you said, it's it's not about that, finding the right person, right? Um, I want to touch one one more thing on that for Grace. Uh, if a mentor is offering to help you, you're not wasting their time. You're only wasting your time. You're only wasting their time if you don't carry through with the work. And don't worry, Grace, if, you're, if your computer dies, um, <laughs> we are recording this. <laughs> All right. Um, so, okay. Here, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So I was just wondering, in your experience in the game industry, what do you think are the qualities that make a great teammate on any um, game production team? Hmm. Qualities that make a great teammate. So work and skill aside, um, it's probably just gonna be the basic things that make, make a great team member on any team, right? Um, being aware of your team, being supportive uh, and being engaged with the team, right? So we're all at home now or even within the office, right? You, you can be, you can, you can really uh, be in a silo and be by yourself 
and, and kind of not know what your, the rest of your team is going into or are facing or dealing with on the work side that you could potentially help out with or, or potentially share some information with. So for me, it's always one of those things, one of the key features of a good team member to me is like someone who is completely invested into the team. Like, hey, you know, like Seth, what are you working on today? Okay, you know, I see that you're working on that. And you were banging your hand on the, on the table. What's going on, man? Maybe I can help you out. You're, oh, I see here, you're trying to divide by zero. That's the problem, you know. Um, Helping each other out and 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 treating treating folks like you want to be treated. I I hate to to, to break it down to so simple, but that has shown uh, to be very very valuable, especially during the times as as a pandemic. Uh, we're all going through things mentally that's outside of our work, um, and and you know being aware of that. So right now, just being a good human really, really helps. All right, I'll try my best to be a good person. But um, I also was wondering, um, what's your favorite team that you've ever worked with in the past? Oh, I, I think my favorite team that I've ever, ooh. Um, so I, I absolutely love the team at Farbridge. We are, we are extremely close. And I'm not just saying that because I currently work there. Uh, the other team that I would I would give a, a big shout out to is Blue Point Studios, who just got purchased by Sony. Um, they also had that that very family feeling, and I think that's one of the one of the big things that I, I, I like about that the, both of those teams. Right, it's it's that family feeling. It's like again, we're 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 all just people trying to make video games. I'm not trying to save someone's life. I am not trying to protect the country i'm making a video game so you know uh, if if you have a bad day man hey I, I get it you have a bad day go take a nap and you know or, or hey let's you know one of our one of our team members today their their child hurt their ankle right so hey man you know what take it easy for us today i got your workload you go be a dad and and, and, and that stuff right and so those type of environments um, really lend themselves to allowing me to work and allowing the rest of the team to work freely because they can be who they want to be. You don't have to pretend to be someone else like this. Oh, I'm, I'm a dad. I have two kids. Yeah, I have my kids running through here sometimes on presentations on on big talks with, with EA, right? My, my 14-year-old son will run through ah, and it's like, it, it is who it is, you know, we're a family. So that's that's how it is. All right, thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Um, I have one. When asking uh, someone to be your mentor, is it, I guess, is it appropriate to be direct or is it kind of like an implied title or like, it feels weird. It's like, will you be my mentor? It's like, asking someone to be like your sensei or something. It's kind of strange, but is that like industry term that people get maybe? Yeah, no. So some people, uh, if people get that, get that, um, that term. It's not, it, it's not strange. Um, some folks may be unprepared for it uh and, and may not have the time for it and that may be why they might tell you no um and but you don't have to be that you can be that that direct but you don't have to be like you just say hey you know uh logan i i saw what you did uh um you know on such and such game i'd love to learn from you like if maybe if you have like maybe 30 minutes a month or something like that or maybe 30 minutes every week i could call you up and sort of pick your brain because I'd love to do what you're doing, but you know I'm in I'm in school right now, and so I just want to kind of get prepared for when I leave school. Maybe we can set up a meeting like maybe 30 minutes a day, right? I never once said the word mentor, but you're going to be my mentor. You're going to teach me, so you don't have to use that word. You can just can you help me out? Can you help me learn? All right, that sounds pretty natural. I I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a question on like uh, building a portfolio 
for like a game designer specifically, since you're you're talking about like you're it's not just for uh, like programmers or artists, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't like I was actually specifically wanting, specifically wanting to be a content designer. So just the intersection of like narrative uh, and level design, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I don't know exactly what to put there, like snippets of writing or just level design or exactly uh, people would be uh, employers would be looking for. So you can put, you can definitely put both. Um, I would say, so if you're looking for content design, um, you would want to put your overall view of what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So if it's, if it's an entire story arc that should be fit in the middle of a game that, or, or an additional DLC or something like that, let's, let me take it a step back. Let's say um, you are making a mod for Skyrim and you are building out a story arc, you're building out maybe some sets and things like that, uh, you can put all of that on your portfolio. And you can then maybe put a link to a YouTube playthrough, right? And so if there is a way to experience what your finished content is, that might be the easiest way to display and say, hey, these are the things that I was responsible for. I was responsible for, you know, these dialogue trees, I was responsible for um, the direction that happens when the character gets to this point, you know, the dragon comes over the hill and I, I you know, had that scripted in like that to be a part of this storyline, so forth and so on. So you can definitely do that. And um, I, would, I would even say like, take a look at some narrative designers, uh, portfolios and things like that. Yes, most of their stuff will be text, um, sometimes people will, will take the chance and opportunity to display the finished product. Maybe it's voice acted, maybe it's, you know, just in a game rendered on screen. Um, but yeah. So I guess, uh, a tip there is like, don't be afraid of more text. If you want to be a content designer for your portfolio. Yeah. If, if you're, if you're going to be a narrative designer, I, I and if I'm hiring a narrative designer, I'm going to be sitting back reading. That's, yeah. that's, yeah, you know, that's the, that's the, the bare minimum that I will have to be there uh, for sure. So, and yeah, that's definitely acceptable. Thanks. We have a question from Adeline. Um, does it make it difficult to break into the industry if you have very little experience with playing video games or have little knowledge about all the games that exist? So I'm going to answer this in the worst way possible. Yes and no. Yes, in certain cases, depending on what it is you want to do in the industry. No, in certain cases, based on what you want to do in the industry, right? So if you don't have a lot of knowledge uh, about the existing games out there, and let's say, for instance, you want to be in business development, you don't necessarily need to know a bunch of different video games and, and have played a bunch of different video games to know that, hey, my studio can do services for your company. I want to take your money to do those, those services, right? Um, that's fine. You don't need to, to have a bunch of experience. And then, or, you know, a bunch of experience playing and uh, trying out different video games. And the other way to look at it too is, let's say, uh, you don't play a lot of video games. Let's just say you play a bunch of platformers. You're into Mario, you're into Sonic, uh, um, maybe Celeste, uh, you know, now I'm like rattling off different names of games, but hey, those are the games that you like. So you're probably gonna go try to work at a studio that makes those type of games. You don't need to know about uh, Star Citizen. You don't need to know about Elite Dangerous because guess what, you're not, you're not into making space sims you're into platforms. So don't let your knowledge or experience on playing games hold you back. What I will say is if you take the time and play the games that you like and learn as much as you can about those type of games, that can actually turn out to be a benefit, right? So if you know everything about platformers and pixel perfect jumps and you know the platform is this long, but the hitbox is actually slightly longer and da 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 da, da that can actually be a benefit. So yeah, don't, don't let that hold you back. 
I don't know about every game. I got two kids. I don't I don't have enough time to play video games. That is the truth. Uh, one of the things I used to say uh, when people ask, how many games have you played lately? I'm like, well, to be honest, I'm in grad school and I'm like working three jobs, so not many. <laughs> Yep, exactly. You know, you can be honest about it. Um, so here's here's a question. Um, what do you um oh what are some interview do's and don'ts? Um <clears throat> a couple of couple of different things I'd like to say about interviews. Um don't be afraid to ask right in the interview. So this is <laughs> This is almost a tip from the sales person in me. At the end of every interview, I will straight up ask. So when do I start? Like I might ask part jokingly, or I might ask, uh, so okay, well, what did you think? What did, what, how did you think that went? I will ask it right then and there. I don't wanna give you time to go back and confer with your, your other folks. I wanna know just for me. Like, if you thought I did crappily, great. If you thought I didn't fit, great. I can go on about my merry way. But if you thought I did well, I'm going to put in a little bit more effort when I go home and I follow up with an email saying, hey, thank you for your time, this, that, and the other. The other thing, too, is um, whenever you go into an interview, an interview is a two-way street. Um, there they're there to get to know you. You absolutely should be there to get to know them. Uh, you should come in with questions about their culture. Uh, you should come in with questions about their upcoming projects, uh, how they approach different things. Um, it's very important that you get to know these studios, right? Again, alluding back to the horrible things that are in the news, not every studio is the same. And, and getting to know that studio and understanding this important thing too, during an interview, that is the best that a, a place is going to treat you. If you feel like even during the interview, you got some like some weird vibes or like, oh man, they're, I don't really like you know their attitude or how they're treating me. That is literally the best they're going to be towards you, right? That's their first time meeting you. That's them trying to impress you. So they should be on their A game. Um, but yeah, you know, come to the interview with questions in hand. You should be getting to know them. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Cesar. Does one get to explore different parts of the industry while working in the industry? Or does the exploration happen more before getting into the industry? Yeah, depending on the studio, uh, you, you definitely do get some exploration once you're in the industry. Um, my studio in particular, Farbridge, once a month we have what's called a jam day, where literally I'm not allowed to take any business calls. Uh, I'm not really allowed to work on work. I am supposed to be working on a theme um in a different discipline we want people to ideally work in different disciplines um just to literally try it so like uh there was this one time where we have we have this vr game and the engineers built out some tools to make it for easy for us non-engineers to build levels and i i was a game designer i was a level designer for for an entire day being paid uh to muck around and, and build out a level and so there are a lot of studios that do things like that. So yes, you do get some ex uh, exploration once you're in the in the industry. And the other thing too is, you know, you're sitting you're sitting with these folks day in and day out. It, it, you know, you could put some effort in and just do it yourself and and say, hey, uh, you know, Cesar, I I see that you're you're in you're in sound design, man. That's that's pretty cool. I'm over here in programming. So what tools are you using? You know, how do you, how did you make that? that horn sound on level three or blah, blah, blah. Do it yourself, right? You don't necessarily have to wait on your studio to do it. Build those relationships, networking, and learn. Absolutely. Yeah, I have a, I have a friend who, he's at ILM now, but he got into character modeling 
uh, actually at work. He started in environments and tools. And he wanted to get into character modeling. So he would just on his time at home, he would practice. And then he would bring in his models to show to the character modeling team. He would get feedback from them. And then when they had an opening, they thought about him because he had improved so much. And then he, and that's how he moved into to character modeling. Yeah, like here's here's one thing I also want you guys to think about is that in a good studio, the, the boss or the bosses are gonna want y'all to be happy. And if they see you having a lot of joy doing something like character modeling, whereas you might be doing scripting, they're gonna be like, yo, Person X does a lot more work and a lot more creativity in this particular discipline over this one. Let's go put them in that discipline. That seems to make them happy. So yeah, they, that, that, that sort of thing happens all the time. Oh, you're muted. I am muted. Um, so we have a lot of thank yous. Thank you from Adeline. Uh, Grace says, um, she had not heard the interview is the best they're going to treat you. And it sounds like a nugget of wisdom that should be self-evident, but it really isn't. So thank you. And uh, Cesar said, that's great. Thank you very yeah. much for your valuable time. So we have a little under 15 minutes left. Are there any, are there any other questions uh, from everybody? I want to say also, if you if y'all want, y'all can uh, join ATX Game Makers. If you go to atxgamemakers.com, there's a link for the Discord. Uh, it's not just for people in Austin. It's just, again, my creativity of naming things. Um, you can definitely join up there and feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn or Twitter. My Twitter handle is TallGamer. Uh, LinkedIn, I'm on there as Donald Harris. So definitely feel free to, to hit me up, connect with me there. And there you go, you're starting off building a network. Could you explain more about what ATX Game Makers does? Yeah, so um, the, the basic idea for ATX Game Makers was I was throwing get togethers uh, centered around one topic every month. And these get togethers would be, let's say, okay, we're gonna talk about production. And within these get togethers, I would call all of my industry friends to come out. And so I had this big mix of people who weren't in the industry and people who, who are in the industry in one spot so that you can get there and you can start networking, you can start asking all of these questions that y'all are asking right now to people in, in all of these different, uh, different companies and different disciplines. And so the goal of that was to help anyone who felt underrepresented or didn't have a place, they did, felt like they didn't have a place in the industry, um, they would come out and, and attend these events and then we could get them building a network, building a mentorship and eventually getting them into the industry. And so now what we do is we just have this huge uh, discord. I think it's around 550 people uh, in there and essentially doing the same thing. And now we are, are going further into it to where, you know, we have a job board where people are posting jobs and people are posting their portfolios and asking for reviews. And so what's funny is like, you know, you, you can post your portfolio up and you can ask for a review. You might get some art director from a local studio looking at your stuff, right? And so, you know, what I will say is when you, when you join, uh, definitely join it with some professionalism and, and understand that that person that, you know, that is in there and we're, it's not all stuff in there. We're, we talk about goofy stuff all the time, but, um, you know, just understand that these are some industry leaders that are in there and yeah, you can, you can definitely make some really, really good connections there. Do you like me to share my screen to show the discord or do you want to share yours? Yeah. Um, well, if you go to, uh, are you saying like just show the, the Discord screen? Yeah, just show kind of there. the Discord content. Um, I have oh, yeah. it, but if you want to show yours, you, you can. Yep, give me one second. Move this over here. <clears throat> so 
so yeah, so this is, you know, the, the, the general uh, breakdown of it. You know, we've got the announcements room where we have all of the, the upcoming events and things like that we'll talk about. Obviously, the good old rules and info, that's where you want to first come in and you'll have to sign off on the agreement there. Uh, this is the main channel here. Introductions, that's where you want to talk about yourself, introduce yourself to the entire group so that they can read about you and know, okay, okay, this person is in school, they want to get into this, that, and the other. Boom, bada, boom, bada, boom. Uh, and then, of course, general chat, chat, which is, you know, just general goofiness and all fun. Um, the, the show and tell, and it's not just Yes, it's, it's a lot of art, but you'll find people in here will, will talk about their games, they'll talk about uh, narrative content, they'll talk about parts that they worked on, everything. And it's a great place to get some feedback. Team building, if you wanna find folks to, to work with and stuff like that. Uh, and this is that job board that I'm telling you about. So like, you know, someone from Infinity Ward uh, posted there, uh, some Aspire folks. Um, this guy here, Jacob, is pretty awesome. He just recently got on uh, at, at Aspire. That's also a really cool story, too. Um, it, it was really cool working with him, working through his resume and things like that. And then, like, he gets the job, and literally a week later, I'm in a business meeting with this, this fellow that, you know, was in ATX Game Makers that I was helping him get a job. So it's, like, really, really small world. Um, so, yeah. I, there's, there's folks from all over the place. The, uh, game designer. Yeah, there's a lot. Um, and then, of course, we have different rooms for all of the disciplines that I know about so that you can go in there. You can start, like, chatting it up. So, yeah, it's uh, it's big. It's it's uh, I, it's definitely something I think that's uh, pretty beneficial to a lot of folks. And, yeah, it's free. Like, so why not go get in there and get LinkedIn? to a bunch of people. I think we have time for one more question. Is there one more question for Donald? We have a question in the chat. What are some red flags to look for in a mentor? And if you don't think you're getting what you need to improve, how do you recommend tactfully saying it's not working out? <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, so red flags in, in a mentor. Um, I think the biggest red flag in a mentor is, is watching their motivation level when they're speaking with you or they're trying to work with you, right? So if it's pulling teeth with your mentor to get meetings out of you, um, that can be tough, right? right? Like you, your energy level uh it's probably going to be a little bit higher than your mentors just because like you're, you're you know you're wanting to get in there but if you spend a lot of time trying to pull information out of them and trying to to uh get them to meet with you or trying to uh make those next steps then it's that, that would be a huge huge red flag because that means their heart isn't into it uh and they're not they're not putting the time into you that you may need to grow now, if you're in a situation to where, uh, you know, you feel that it's not working out, I, there is nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know, I, I think it was great. I, I had a good time, you know, learning what I did learn from you or, or you know, we, we had an okay time or whatever the case would be, but I think I need to move on, right? Um, I'm going to try to to study on my own or, or this side or the other right you can gracefully bow out um, again you don't want to insult them just uh, you don't want to be rude about it just again because it is a small industry you might end up working for that person um, but uh, you know and, and again you got to be mindful that things happen in other people's lives and sometimes it could take it could take them away from mentoring you so um, so yeah there's I mean you just gotta, it's kind of like any other breakup, right? You gotta kind of be as graceful and, and clear about it as possible. And I know we have like six minutes left. One person asked this one thing and I think it, it's a short answer, um, but an important question is, is uh, we use Discord a lot in our classes, but is Discord used in the industry? Yeah, um, yeah, there's, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Discord, Slack, I hate Teams, absolutely hate Teams. Um, but is yeah, that no, micro, Microsoft Teams? Yeah, yeah, that, that, oh God, I hate it. 
I hate that app so much. Um, and unfortunately, it's used a lot of places. But um, yeah, different studios will use different little chat apps. Discord is 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 one um, because there's a lot of extensions that you can do within Discord and a lot of customization that you can do in there. So yeah, it's definitely used. And then you'll find if 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 you use um, if you get with a company that uses Slack, it's an easy transition. Well, I think that's um, oh. Yeah, someone and uh, said so Discord has really exploded over the last couple of years. It's really interesting how it was really just marketed to gamers and casual groups, but now it's using the industry a lot. Yeah. Well, I think that is all the time we have. It We have like five minutes to spare, um, but I really wanted to thank you, Donald, for taking the time to come uh, speak with us here at Viz. It, it means a lot. Um, and don't forget remember what donald said he said network don't forget to connect to him right yep. i've got I've, i think i've gotten only one connection so far i'm not telling anybody i'm just saying <laughs> i put I'm his here. handles in the chat so please copy and paste them before we leave zoom because as you know you you can't keep the chat once zoom is gone <laughs> and if and if you don't have a linkedin to connect with me make a linkedin Yes, yes, yes. Everybody is saying thank you so much. And right we will on. have it a was a pleasure. Yes, and we'll have a recording of this on YouTube as well in a couple of days. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye, I appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much. You guys thank are you. welcome. <laughs>